Hello, everyone. Uh, this is a new episode of the Global Judicial Integrity Network podcast series. Uh, we are here today with Judge uh, Lilian uh, Tibatenwa uh, of Uganda, of the Supreme Court of Uganda. Thank you so much for talking to us today, Justice. Uh, we'll start by asking you uh, a question about your professional background. So throughout your career, you have achieved a lot of firsts as a woman in the judiciary. Could you please briefly describe your professional background for us? Um, thank you very much, Roberta. Uh, perhaps when you talk about my professional background, I will talk about my professional background before I came to the judiciary because my entry into the judiciary is rather recent. Um, I started uh, my career as a uh, a professor of law, although of course professorship came at the end. Uh, but after some time, after years in the academy, I moved uh, into the management of higher education. So when I moved into the judiciary, I was appointed as a justice of the Court of Appeal. And in Uganda, the Court of Appeal also serves as the Constitutional Court. It's the Court of First Instance in constitutional matters. After two years, I was appointed to the uh, Supreme Court where I am today. Yes, now you were asking me about being a lady of firsts. Yes, I was the first woman in East Africa to graduate with a, a doctorate in law. Mm -hmm. And I also was the first woman in East Africa to become an associate professor and then a professor of law. And then at Makere University, I was the first woman to be appointed into the position of deputy vice chancellor in charge of academic affairs. And it is actually amazing, or perhaps uh, it, it's wonderful that later on now I'm part of the judiciary because I was mm -hmm. talking about the processing of women in the judicial system, and now I'm part of the judicial system so I can clearly see the gendered nature of judicial processes and so on and so forth. But I think that is enough <laughs> in as far as my background is concerned. Uh, mm. No, that's, uh, that's quite an impressive uh, mm -hmm. background. And uh, mm -hmm. as a woman uh, judge and, and also considering this extensive background, do you think you bring a more diverse perspective to the court? Yes, and I think I will answer that in two parts. I think there are certain things which you can only appreciate if you have had experience. I, I think I can only speak as, I mean, I, I'm a lawyer, yes, but I'm a woman, yes. So even as a judicial officer, being a woman may make me understand some nuances better than I would I mean, nuances in relation to women's rights and experiences in a way which is different from a man's understanding. Because we have to always remember that when we talk about gender, we are talking about uh, in a patriarchal society, you are talking about power relations, unequal power relations. So really, if you belong to a group of people in society which is in power, there is no way you're going to be able to understand the position of a person who is actually on the other end of the spectrum. And I, and, and, and I think the best way to even explain this is that if somebody actually say to you, Roberta, that, uh, race, that, 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 that race issues can be understood by everybody in the same way. Would it really be right? If, for example, somebody is, has lived in a country where race is an issue and belongs to the powerful racial group, of course, there is no way that person will deeply understand what it is to be oppressed on the basis of race or mm -hmm. color. So th that's how I would want to look at it, that yes, in a way, a woman would be able to understand the oppression of women in a way different from a man perhaps who looks at his mother being oppressed because she's a woman or sister because she's a woman. Yes, they will understand it, but not 
It's not an experience. It's not a personal experience. Uh, although, yes, I will keep on uh, insisting that not every woman is aware of the nuances of gender oppression. But sometimes I think it's also an intellectual issue that you have to, somebody should uh, really uh, help you understand, even from an intellectual point of view, what it means to live in society as a woman, in a patriarchal society as a woman. Because sometimes if you've been brought up in a, a, a community or society where women are oppressed, you take it as the norm. But I do believe that my being a researcher, my being an academic, somebody who has done research in these areas, I think I'm um, better placed to understand the lived realities of women. Because before I went to, came to the bench, I did a lot of research, for example, in the area of uh, violence against women. So I think that helps you understand issues in a way which may be different from somebody who is, uh, had a different, um, a different uh, professional background mm -hmm. as yeah. such. Mm. And picking up on your experience with mm. uh, cases and the research mm -hmm. on the cases of violence against women, mm. uh, what potential biases should judges be mindful of when judging such cases? I think when, when we talk about, of course, uh, bias, we are talking about stereotyping. So, <laughs> and I'll give you a very clear example. If you have grown up in a society which think, you know which uh, sort of uh, presents women as sexual objects certainly when you are you know adjudicating over a case of rape you must step back and know that the person who is before you as a, a complainant is a is somebody complaining within the context of violation of rights. But I think sometimes when you look at the judgments that come out, you can see somebody who, has, who is coming up with a judgment and making statements because of socialization. And um, I, I think also when we talk about uh, bias and stereotyping, I remember sitting in a class, a low class, and I was being told that when somebody comes before you as a, a survivor, a victim, a complainant in a sexual offense, you cannot, you should warn yourself of the danger of convicting an accused person in a sexual offense without, in, you know, on the basis of the testimony of the complainant, without seeking for independent evidence to support, to support that story. Mm -hmm. That is clearly a stereotype. But how did I realize that it was a stereotype? I did research and ask my question, my, the question, what is the basis of this rule? And I'm not saying that people who go to the bench without having been researchers will not have a critical analytical mind. But I think for me, I have an analytical mind precisely because I was a researcher before. So I asked, where did this come from? And then I said, well, why would a woman tell lies in a sexual assault case, but won't tell lies in a property-related case? <laughs> you know, if somebody's a liar, they are liars. They should tell lies all over. But you can't tell me that women tell false, uh, tell, uh, uh, false stories in sexual assaults. And then when it comes to this woman appearing before you, in a property-related case, you can believe her story without corroboration. So for, for me, I think that, that's when I started saying I had better be careful that when I am sitting as a judge, I don't bring biases which either come I come along with because of how I was trained or because I'm a woman mm -hmm. or, or because I come from a certain socioeconomic background, you know, how you look at people who come from other backgrounds and you think just because they come from certain social backgrounds, they are necessarily uh, less credible. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I think when we talk about biases, it's, th th there's bias which is obvious, and I think that is easy to deal with, but it's extremely important that we 
accept that sometimes we have we are biased without knowing mm -hmm. so I yes bias, the unconscious yeah. bias is what we should deal with and I sort of feel that unconscious bias can only be or is better handled with training mm -hmm. you know because if it is unconscious then you won't be able to know that to you are actually biased to self-adjust yes 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 mm -hmm. so it's a question of self-evaluation but you cannot evaluate yourself you know in abstract you must be with other people you know you go through questions and then you realize mm, mm -hmm. isn't that a basis of bias after that kind of training think about other possible biases mm -hmm. and use the skills you've gotten here to also say i will not be biased against somebody because they are elderly mm -hmm. i would not be biased against a person because they are uneducated because they are poor uh, and all those, there are so many biases which can come up because this is not the only time you are going to be biased. There are many, many other cases which will come before you. And if you are not careful, if you do not realize the ability, the, rather the potential to be biased, then you won't be a good judge. Mm. Thank you. That was extremely interesting. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you so much for your participation in this episode of our podcast series. Mm -hmm. uh, this was uh, Justice Lilian Tibatenwa of the Supreme Court of Uganda mm -hmm. talking to us about gender bias and other biases that might manifest uh, in the judicial decision process. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Lillian. Uh, and to everyone listening, uh, stay tuned for more episodes of the podcast series of the Global Judicial Integrity Network.